sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. This is fascinating. We brought this up on the show yesterday. I love it. I love it when billionaires lob grenades and other billionaires making sports more fun. And I don't know how much this is going to actually ruffle the feathers of people inside the Target Center facility, but I don't think Glenn even like checks the internet, so it's going to be on Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez to get offended by this. Glenn called these guys. Well, I don't so think he Glenn's does. Like, Glenn talk to the I'm kid good. though. Does Glenn talk to Josh Cronky or does he just talk to old Stan Cronky? Glenn's going to say, "Look, I was above board here, Stanny, Stanny boy." <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't. So let's. That's a good point. What do you? What are you guys mad at? You know, we went, we went through all the proper channels around here to steal your guy and double his paycheck. By the way, this is Mackie and Judd Daily, Minnesota Sports Entertainment Therapy Speculation. We're going to, with the Twins playing the Yankees this week, later in the show, and on the Score North YouTube channel, we're going to talk to a Talking Jake, co-host of the number one baseball podcast in America, Talking Baseball and Talking Yanks as well. Get his perspective on uh, which Yankees beatdown over the Twins is his favorite go-to memory when he's feeling down as a Yankees fan. But uh, here's the write-up. I'm getting this from a Star Tribune recap of some comments from Josh Kroenke, one of the uh, the family owners of the Denver Nuggets. And he's not very happy about the way things went down and the way that Tim Connolly left the Denver Nuggets for the Minnesota Timberwolves. He said... He didn't know exactly what the Timberwolves had offered Connolly, even invoking the phrase phantom equity condescendingly, but intimated there was some type of bonus scheme. Regardless of what it was, Kroenke said the Nuggets aren't a startup organization that would offer such incentives. I mean, the Wolves aren't a startup either, but okay, I get it. they're, they're, They're bad and they're embarrassing historically, but they are not a startup. Quote, ultimately, when you go to a stratosphere that some clubs, you say some desperate clubs are willing to go to, there's a tier out there that just kind of doesn't make sense, Kroenke said, when it comes to compensation for Pobos. These aren't quite fighting words, but they seem pretty intentional. The Star Tribune writes, Kroenke twice used the word desperate and described the Wolves' initial approach of Connolly as going through the side door. Sports Illustrated had another interesting Kroenke quote. I felt that we made a very competitive offer that would have allowed him to feel good about staying in Denver. And ultimately, he felt that some of the upside there on the back end through some of the bonus schemes were probably too good to pass up for his family. What do you think of Josh Kroenke calling the Timberwolves desperate and using the word scheme and side door for how they wound up coaxing Ben Connolly? So I think uh, because I have not. What did I say? Ben Connolly? Ben Connolly. I've been Tim calling him Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Connolly. Con- Kevin Connolly. I've been calling him That's E from right. Entourage. I was like, I, I can't get it out. I can't. can't. I can Tim, Tim Connolly. Tim Sorry. Connolly. Yeah. Um, I believe, and full full credit here to our guy, Darren Doogie Wolfson of Scoop fame, because uh, Darren told us this a couple weeks ago, and he clearly hit a home run here. This is all about one thing, the equity, Right. And, and I'll go back to what we talked about last week when in the press conference on Tuesday, when Dukes asked Conley about that, that was when everyone got sort of like nervous and then Glenn grabbed the mic and said, everyone's got bonuses, which is just utter crap. Like that's just he's full of crap. It's a there, bonus structure. It's a bo- no, it it's not. Well. People have bonus structure. Yeah, well. He does yeah, well. That's exactly that's crap. Okay. Dukes hit on this and and Dukes told us flat out that he told us the rest of the league is mad. So this is the problem. The problem is that in Conley's contract, much to the Wolves dismay because they're trying to to keep this quiet. There is clearly the the tipping point here is not I don't think the contract. I don't think it's like the years, I don't think it's the salary for Tim Conley. I think it is the thing that that is why he came here, Phil, is directly related to promises of equity in the team, which even a very, very small is a huge uh, financial boon potentially. So to Doogie's credit, I think he hit on why Kroenke's mad. 
I think the rest of the league is mad because this sets an interesting precedent of, I think you are really good and I am willing to pay you with a small piece of my franchise to which is why Kroenke says desperate, which the Wolves are, but A-Rod and Laurie don't care. So I, I and I, I think that I, I, I should probably be careful what I say here because I don't I haven't done enough backgrounding on this, but I think you can't actually have ownership stake unless you buy into the franchise and he's not. So you can't just say, oh, we like this guy. Here's one percent of the franchise. I think you have to actually buy into the franchise if you want that that scratch, so to speak. But is there a way where they could? And I'm yeah. just spitballing here. Could they yes. have said? Yeah. Hey, you know, the franchise value, if the franchise value goes up, however they would determine that, I doubt if they're using Forbes, but if the franchise value goes up from $1.55 billion to $1.8 billion because we've built a perennial contender in the Western Conference, then you get to ride that wave with some sort of bonus structure. Like, like in radio, for instance, it's very common that, you know, if you hit top five in your demographic, men 25 to 54, that means that the company's bringing in a lot of revenue because you're top five, and then you get some sort of bonus, you know, check or whatever. Like, I don't know how they're, if it's revenue based or if I doubt if it's just tied to wins and losses. It sounds like it's tied to the value of the franchise in some way or some sort of revenue because it sounds like it's more of a financial thing than a wins and losses incentive, but clearly love, they tied them in somehow. I love this. Play the sounder. I think, I think I got it. Which sounder? I literally have Reckless a page speculation. of six. Okay. Reckless speculation sounder. <laughs> I think I got it. Reckless speculation. So Glenn grabs the mic, right? It's a boner structure. Everyone's got a boner structure. What <laughs> if it's this? I think I got it, boys. What would make perfect sense is this. The Wolves start to win. The Wolves get good, which I know sounds really weird, but it's plausible now, right? The Wolves get good. I, gu- I guarantee you this. Tim Conley's equity is in approval of a new building that's what it's going to be think about it it makes perfect sense Hmm. if the wolves get good enough to get a building their value skyrockets like skyrockets it would make perfect sense where if they win enough to get a building that tim conley would be a would be one of the primary beneficiaries because that would mean mm. that he continued to build the team because I think how would you end- tie a bonus to a to a an arena though it, it would just wouldn't it just be a revenue hey, if we hit this level of revenue yeah then you it, get uh, some sort of okay. percentage of I'll give uh, you a for instance without naming names there might have been somebody involved with the Vikings who had a one million dollar bonus paid to him when U.S. Bank Stadium was approved. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I, but I don't want to give out names. I don't want to give out specifics, and I won't do that. Tavares Jackson. I won't break. I won't the, break, yeah. I won't break confidences that Brett Favre received. Brett Favre. That was Brett um, Favre. Yes. Uh, but that being said, <laughs> look, there are ways, business wise, as we all know, to get very creative, right? But I'm I'm just going back to I don't think that the rest of the league and Cronky, young Cronky here, are upset because Conley left for a salary. I think that there's more to, to this. But a new building makes the most sense to tie bonuses to, to say if we get this, everyone's going to benefit. Yeah, and let's 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 close the book on the Cronkies here for a second. because So this was Josh Cronky, who I believe, isn't he the son of Stan Cronky? He's, oh, he's, he's a next-generation Cronky. I want to I wanna verify that real quick because Stan is – I mean, Stan literally owns – Stan owns the Rams. I think Stan owns a bunch of other Walmart, franchises right? around. That's the Walmart family. So he's married right. to Ann Walton. Y- yes. Yes. But Josh is, um, yes. Josh is 42 years old. He's trying to carve his, you know, sometimes these like second, third generation slick ricks that get born into these families. You know, I'm, I'm going to make my name known by saying something controversial, right? So together, Stan and Ann from the Walmart family, are worth more than $11 billion, okay? So they're worth quite a bit more than Glenn Taylor is worth. And I get that your net worth isn't just liquid cash flow that you can just, like, write checks to people. A lot of it's tied up in assets or companies. You know, if if a company you own is worth X amount, that's part of your net worth, whatever percentage you own, right? So, So I get that it's not all liquid, but the amount of money in question here is in the tens of millions. Even whatever this bonus scheme or structure is, it's not going to pay 
Connolly a billion dollars. Like we're like we're probably talking about. So he's going to make eight million dollars a year, and then I again I'm just educated guess here. Whatever he would make in a bonus structure or equity is going to be also probably in the tens of millions of dollars range. Nothing that comes close to the worth of that family or the Cronkies. So the Wolves made a better offer. The Cronkies got a little frugal. And they made their decision to not, you know, match the Wolves' offer. Mm -hmm. Go find someone else. And what I find interesting here is if you don't value the head of your operations— at eight to ten million dollars a year, when you're when you own a franchise that's worth one and a half or two billion dollars, then don't you just think that that position's replaceable? I mean, think about the money you pay players. Like you pay Mal- Malik Beasley is going to make two times as much money as the guy that runs the Timberwolves front office. I've always this is always a fascinating thing to me when 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 Theo Epstein went from the Red Sox to the Cubs ten years ago. And we knew what Theo Epstein was by then. He had won three World Series. He broke the curse in Boston. He was the best front office architect in all of baseball. Mm-hmm. He goes to the Cubs to revive a dormant franchise that hadn't won a World Series in over 100 years. And his base salary was like $4 million. He made less money. There, there were like 14 players on that Cubs team in 2011 when he took over that made more money than Theo, including two former twins, Matt Garza and Carlos Silva. But but obviously Theo Epstein is much more important to the success of the Cubs than Carlos Silva or you know you know Ryan Dempster or whoever else was on that team. So I I just my grand point here is if you have a guy that can be a great architect of your front office and organization, he is worth a lot of money and probably more money than some of the players on the team. And if the if the Denver Nuggets said ah we don't think so okay cool that's fine but don't then get salty. And call the Timberwolves desperate. And and you know what? The Timberwolves are kind of desperate, quite frankly. But this was still a great move to bring this dude in. But they're mad because, and I, I think that the reason why the rest of the league is mad is this probably sets a precedent that they hate, which is to give something that you ordinarily don't give. So again, I, I don't think it comes down to years or term of contract. I think it comes down to the things that the wolves aren't going to talk about, which now, which now means if I want to go poach a guy next time, I'm going to be like, how about a little taste of the franchise? We'll do something here. Now, if I'm a wolves fan, I'm thrilled. And here's why this is very Mark Cuban like, because basically a rod and Lori have violated like the code right behind the scenes of clearly we don't ordinarily do this yeah who, cuban yeah. doesn't care right they don't care so yes it's desperate but it's also refreshing because this is the exact type i mean i guarantee you glenn called the cronkies to be like this is not my idea i'm not doing this like there are codes it's why there's weird stuff that transpires or does not transpire and so I guarantee you that this all stems from the fact that the Wolves now are basically going to say, we don't care what your rules are. We want to win basketball well, games. Well, and did, okay, and I'll, I'll ask a, maybe a rhetorical question. Did the Timberwolves do anything against the NBA rules? I don't think so, no. No, I think it, okay. I think it went against the un, the unwritten rules oh, yeah, okay. and good for the Wolves. So then, so then what ground does Denver have to stand on? The Wolves within the confines of the NBA's rules. The Wolves made a better offer, which is awesome. <laughs> We've been wanting some of these Minnesota teams to continue to step up. and So they made a better offer for a great president of basketball operations. Denver chose not to match the offer. Okay, that's it. You, you want to be salty? That's fine. But your fr- it sounds like your franchise, it, it, it probably feels to them like they missed a great window of opportunity with an MVP of the league. They went to the conference finals a couple years ago. Injuries have, have have derailed them a little bit, but it kind of feels to them like, oh my gosh, now we got some contract situations coming up. Our Pobo is gone. That's your own mess to clean up at this point. Don't throw stones at the Timberwolves. We're Teflon over here, though. We've been dealing with it for 30 years. Hey, self If the Wolves are, go- are go- going to stir up trouble and be fun, that's awesome. Yeah. It's great. It is. Uh, and I mean, it remains to be seen how well it works out, obviously. And uh, this is a good segue. The draft is coming up, and that'll be the first chance for Connolly to put his stamp on the organization. Uh, Before I present you guys with something I find to be interesting, 
Let's say hello to our friends at Dennis Kirk, helping keep Score North, Mackie and Judd, and Purple Daily churning on a daily basis over the last three years and helping you, if you like to ride during these summer months, Harleys, Indians, Metro Cruisers, sport bikes, whatever you need, helping you with 160,000 parts and accessories in stock, free shipping on orders over $89, and also same-day shipping on orders placed before 8 p.m. They ship today, ride more, wait less, with Dennis Kirk. Boys, I want a mock. Mock! It is NBA mock, mock draft season, and I have for you a comprehensive first-round mock from the ringer. Kevin, oh, O'Connor, wow. Kevin O'Connor, not to be confused with Kevin O'Connell. <laughs> oh, I thought K-O- they might be doing KOC both jobs. at the ringer. I thought they might be doing both jobs. NBA entertainer, podcaster, and reporter. And I'm, I'm going to spare. I'm not going to go through all these names. Just know that, uh, number one, he does have... Minnesotan Chet Holmgren going number one to the Orlando Magic to join fellow Minnesotan Jalen Suggs. I love it. In that starting lineup. It'll be kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Definitely. But let's make our way down to the 19th overall pick and let's talk about this because this is this is interesting. Okay. The ringer.com in this mock draft from a couple weeks ago has the Timberwolves selecting from the University of Notre Dame wing player Blake Wesley. I want a mm. mock. Mock. Blake. Tell me more about Blake okay. Wesley. So Blake Wesley, it's, it's it, he's listed on some publications as six foot five. The Ringer has him at six foot three. He's a very mm-hmm. lanky six foot three, if that's the case. Nineteen years old, he was a freshman last year. Averaged fifteen points, three assists, four rebounds. Here's the write up. How sure are we about D'Angelo Russell? Be honest. Is he really the starting point guard of a contending team? I like him, but I don't think he's that guy. He'll also be a free agent in 2023. The Wolves should be considering a successor here, possibly even a player who can make D'Lo expendable sooner than later. Wesley isn't necessarily ready yet. He's raw, but he's a bucket getter who has shown a willingness to also be a playmaker. Minnesota is building a roster with a lot of guys who can handle the ball. Wesley is a high upside guard. He's kind of a combo guard, more of a slasher than a point guard, but... He does have good handles. I actually watched a bunch of uh, YouTube videos on him as soon as I saw this mock draft. Very impressed. Wesley is the high upside guard who can develop alongside Anthony Edwards and come off the bench behind D'Angelo Russell and Patrick Beverly for now. He's a slippery ball handler who can get a bucket from anywhere. And the shades of comparisons listed here are Tyler Hero, Jamal Crawford, and Bones Highland, who the Nuggets drafted and was a big-time contributor so that's a Connolly guy there. Um, the pluses, and I'll sum this up because there's a huge write-up here, but he is one of the most athletic players, like just very bouncy, gets to the rim, comes off screens, pretty decent mid-range game, uh, just kind of an energizer bunny player who can make plays for himself and others. The minus is he's a bad shooter. He shot 31% from oh, the field no. and what? 65% from the free throw line. Okay, I'm out. He also wears number zero, which when you watch his game, he kind of reminds you a little bit of like a like a diet Russell Westbrook, just kind of bouncing around and stuff. So can he develop a shot is the question. I'm not taking a bad shooter. No. No, I'm I'm not doing this. I'm intrigued I'm intrigued by this. Because Anthony Edwards was not a great shooter either, and then has become much you can develop some of that stuff. But yeah, you have but to he, you have to be able to determine. Okay, is 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 this a is totally broken Culver? shot or I know? Yeah, like if you're Jared Culver, I, I I'm tired of that. Uh uh-uh. uh. So you're out on Blake Wesley, unless his shot has a fundamental flaw which can be fixed. Yes, I am not going to take a guy who I'm like I really can't shoot. No. I will add. So I I am intrigued by the upside, the explosiveness, etc. Uh, he was really bad in the NCAA tournament. He shot 32 percent from the field in the NCAA tournament. And he missed every three he took. <laughs> he didn't make didn't make a three, and they went kind of didn't they go like three or four games deep? I think Notre Dame made a little run this season. So, but that's I mean, but those are the those are the types of players and prospects that sit there when you're not in the lottery. You're not you're not going to be at night. It's not like the NFL where you're at 19 and there and oh, there's the best guard. No, that's true. Or yeah. oh, there's an, the third edge rusher is still you. there. In the NBA, it's like there might be three franchise changing players, and then there's a bunch of freakishly. 
talented guys, and then there's going to be guys, once you get past the lottery, it's like guys with flaws that need to be fixed, but with upside. But Tim so. Conley, but Tim Conley, part of why he, he has some sort of equity or bonus program in the Wolves is because of the fact that we need to have faith that he can find the best available player who can be a long-term contributor in the draft. Okay, what if he drafts Blake Wesley? Are you going to disagree with him? No, because, because he can't if shoot. He or you're going to try. You're no, going to trust him. Because if he does, then he probably thinks that there's a flaw in the shot that can be fixed. I'm just tired of guys that can't shoot. But anyway, my point is this: I, I think one of the one of the things that we probably don't discuss enough is how little importance this franchise for years put on the second round. And I know it might not be great, but I mean, you go through it. And, and the good teams find guys. And like the Wolves would be like, let's sell off a couple of those picks, right? So I, I think part of bringing in a guy like Conley is to find every means available that you possibly can to build your franchise, including the second round of the draft. I'm reading more of the scouting report. It's great. This is a very football-like scouting report. Energetic defender with long arms, often assigned the opponent's best scorer defensively. He's always locked in off the ball to disrupt actions. He's had countless games where it felt like he was the source of inspiration for the team's collective energy. Wow. A heartbeat player. Good transition player, whether off a steal or a rebound, immediately hits the uh, hits go to jumpstart the offense. Without the ball in his hands, he sprints to go ahead. So I'm, I'm intrigued. Can they teach a jump shot? You, you're not just going to have a bunch of guys. Just, you're not going to have a bunch of Steve Kerr's and Ray Allen sitting outside no. the arc. No. Because I, what I want to be careful of is I don't just want a team full of Malik Beasley's. You know, I sure. need guys that have layers and depth and energy and can play defense and get in passing lanes and stuff. Tim Conley didn't get rich to flub the draft. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> no, he did not. There shall be very few mistakes from here on out as the Timberwolves ascend to an L-O-B. <laughs> I love it. Love the op- optimistic Judd here. Uh, thanks to our friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company for powering this edition of I Want to Mock. They've been partners with the Timberwolves for a long time, too. If you're a business owner out there, Federated is here to help elevate your business to new heights through risk management tools and resources And their corporate culture is grounded in equity, integrity, teamwork, and respect, four cornerstones that create the foundation for all interactions and decision-making at Federated. Federatedinsurance.com, where it's our business to protect yours. All right, boys, we're going to take a pause here. And when we come back on the podcast and on the Score North YouTube channel, we'll catch up with Talkin' Jake from John Boy Media, Yankees and Twins this week.